For the past five years, we've been consistently told by Western media that China has been committing genocide against the Uyghur population, a Muslim ethnic minority who lives in China's far western province of Xinjiang. This message has been told so many times by Western media that it's now widely accepted without question as the undeniable truth. But a new report was recently published from two of the most well-respected Sinologists that completely shatters the entire mainstream narrative. Professor Thomas Huber and Professor Helwig schmidt glinze are two German scholars who have been studying and visiting China for over 50 years. After considerable research, including a private investigation on the ground in Xinjiang, the two professors' findings directly contradict many of the central allegations upon which this entire narrative is based. So who exactly are these two scholars, and can they be trusted? Are they independent and reliable, or simply propagandists paid by the Chinese government, as many instantly claimed? In today's video, I'm going to reveal the shocking truth about Xinjiang that has been kept completely hidden by mainstream media, and I'll show you that there's far more going on in this province than you've been led to believe. Make sure you watch until the end, where I'll reveal the astonishing secret of who these two professors are really working for. Everyone, today's video is sponsored by Bean, one of the best products I've found to help improve my sleep. If you struggle with getting a good night's sleep, make sure that you watch until the end of today's video, as I'll share with you a personal story of how this product has completely transformed my sleep, and I'll also show you how you can get an incredible discount and start improving your sleep today. But first, let's start today's analysis by looking at the newspaper who published this groundbreaking report. The Neue Deutsche Zeitung, NZZ, is a Swiss newspaper and one of the most highly respected in the German-speaking world. World. The article opens with a clear and candid criticism of China's policies in Xinjiang, with the authors asserting Beijing enacted undoubtedly excessive and repressive measures in the region. However, they also reveal the background and history leading up to these measures, which Western media never talks about. Between 2010 and 2016, the region suffered from widespread Islamic terror and was tyrannized by a whopping 12 separatist Islamic movements, under which hundreds of innocent Han Chinese and also Uyghurs were ruthlessly murdered and thousands seriously injured, and under which the rest of the population, including the Uyghurs, suffered immensely. It should be noted that Xinjiang first started experiencing brutal terrorist attacks as far back as 1992. It's also important to note that these attacks were not random, but part of a targeted terrorism campaign with a clear objective. In 2016, Uyghur extremists declared in an ISIS video that they planned to drown all Han Chinese in a sea of blood and began recruiting young Uyghurs as fighters in southern Xinjiang. Furthermore, this reign of terror even nearly led to the complete loss of control of the region by the central Chinese government. Naturally, this crucial piece of the story is never disclosed in Western media. In response, the Chinese government declared a state of emergency, moved military units to the region, and established a strict discipline regime, with the goal of stamping out terrorism once and for all. Criticizing this harsh intervention is perfectly acceptable, but you have to recognize the actions from China's government is far better than how the US government deals with Islamic terrorists, which is frankly bombing them and everyone around them. Ultimately, this key piece of the story undoubtedly adds important context and reveals a much fuller picture of the situation in Xinjiang, especially compared to the version Western media would have us believe, which is that the Chinese government simply suddenly imposed a reign of oppression over the region without any basis or provocation. At this point, it's crucial to acknowledge some important facts about China's relationship with Islam, which might actually surprise you. Western media regularly alleges China has effectively banned religion and is on a mission to eradicate Islam within its borders. But the reality on the ground is very different. First, the history of Islam in China goes way back, with the religion spreading all throughout the country as far back as the 13th century after the Mongol conquest. Second, according to the American Pew Research Center based in Washington, D.C., today there are nearly 40,000 mosques in China, the majority of which are in Xinjiang, with an international consensus that there's about 18 million Muslim adults living in China. By contrast, the 2020 American Mosque Survey counted 2,700 mosques inside the United States for about 2.15 million Muslim adults living inside the U.S. This means that Chinese Muslims have around double the amount of mosques per capita than Muslims do inside the United States. Furthermore, here's a fact that might actually come as a huge surprise to you. Most Muslim-majority countries in the Middle East support 
and have even signed official letters publicly praising China's counterterrorism and de-radicalization measures in Xinjiang. This list includes major Islamic countries including Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, Syria, and Pakistan. However, the next part of their report will truly astonish you. The professors found clear signs that the tense situation in Xinjiang is returning back to normal and that the modernizations initiated by the central government have even received noticeable sympathy from the Uyghur population. Sound absurd? Let's take a closer look. During their independent visit to the province and private investigation with two other German scholars and an international lawyer, they found police street checkpoints were clearly no longer in use and that even the various camps established during the peak of the fight against terror have now largely been dissolved. If this sounds too good to be true, then understand that even Adrian Zenz, a well-known China hawk who first published the groundbreaking study claiming that China is committing a genocide, was recently forced to come to the exact same conclusion. Going back to the modernization efforts, the two professors found that the central government had begun modernizations in education, medical care, and employment. This includes the introduction of 15 years of free education for young Uyghur men and women, including kindergarten, school, and vocational training. In addition, state subsidized healthcare has been implemented, initially in the southern part of Xinjiang, in addition to free education with students receiving 200 yuan a month to support their parents. And if this wasn't enough, the Chinese central government has sponsored the establishment of company branches in Xinjiang and the agricultural and industrial sectors, which are required to employ almost exclusively Uyghurs at nationally valid minimum wage standards, and which is aimed at resolving the relatively high local unemployment. The two China scholars also disclosed that they could not determine a general discrimination against the Uyghur language and culture, but that in Xinjiang, as in all ethnic minority areas, Mandarin has been established as the main language of instruction in schools starting from the secondary level, while the local Uyghur language is still always offered as a subject in all of the schools. When the majority of the world realized that China was in fact not committing genocide against the Uyghur people, Western media had to change their narrative. They shifted their assessment to a cultural genocide and claim that the use of the Mandarin language in schools as proof that the Chinese government is trying to eradicate the local Uyghur's language and culture. To help make this stick, Western media unsurprisingly omitted the fact that the local Uyghur language, far from being eradicated, is still always offered as a subject in schools. However, the real irony here is that establishing a common national language across one's country is actually a completely normal thing to do, and it's also something that virtually every nation on earth does, including all Western countries. All of these findings from this report have in fact all been part of the central government's long-term plan for Xinjiang. After the height of terror in 2016, the subsequent period between 2017 and 2020 corresponded merely to a transitional phase in which Beijing declared the aforementioned state of emergency to fight terrorism. Since the new party secretary Ma Xingrei has been in office since 2021, the central mission has radically shifted to returning to normalcy as quickly as possible. This long-term planning is a key point I've mentioned in previous videos and is absolutely crucial in understanding how China's government operates. Its actions and policies are virtually always part of a bigger long-term plan, which may not always be readily comprehensible or even apparent at first. This is a key difference to Western democracies, where it's difficult to enact long-term plans because politicians must always focus on their upcoming election, and thus they're incentivized to make short-term populist promises, which they typically have trouble keeping. Needless to say, Western media often either knowingly or unknowingly ignores this key difference as it frequently condemns China's actions before understanding the full plan or endgame. Overall, this report will likely baffle those who only read Western media, and sadly, many folks in the West will find this report hard to believe at best, and more likely to instantly dismiss this as CCP propaganda. Therefore, the all-important question here is who exactly are these two German professors, and why should we believe anything that they say? Firstly, if you think that they've been bought out by the Chinese government, to shill for China, think again. As I've demonstrated, Professor Herber and Schmidt Glinze do not at all shy away from criticizing Beijing, nor do they mince their words in their report. Very striking is that they also cite Adrian Zenz in this report. Zenz has produced highly questionable research on Xinjiang that has not withstood basic scrutiny, which of course hasn't prevented Western media from frequently citing it as an established fact. The professor cite him merely to indicate that even he has admitted that these camps have now largely been dissolved. In the process, they even refer to him as a Xinjiang 
Pyongyang expert. Frankly, if the professors are working for the Chinese government, then they're doing a terrible job. It's also important to reiterate that Professor Herber and Schmidt Glinze have been studying and visiting China for over 50 years, long before the country became so political and negatively portrayed in the West. If you study their works published throughout their lives, you won't find a sudden shift to only positive sentiment that would suggest that they've been bought off or that their academic integrity has been compromised. Instantly dismissing them as China propagandists just because they don't parrot the mainstream narrative is simply irrational and intellectually lazy. In conclusion, this stunning report from two of the most distinguished China scholars is simply another reminder that it's imperative we take Western mainstream's media assertions about China with a massive grain of salt. Xinjiang is a complex issue, which requires a deep understanding of China as well as a rigorous and nuanced analysis that's free from agendas and ideological biases. The report from these two German scholars concludes with the following important message. Xinjiang has always and still is a vital part of the Silk Road. If the situation in the province continues to normalize, the EU should initiate dialogue and consider the sanctions it has imposed on China. This is a welcome conclusion and something I've always consistently advocated for on this channel. We live in a global economy, and if the West can find ways to work with China instead of decoupling or de-risking from it, the West, and indeed the entire world, will benefit tremendously, and there is no challenge that we cannot solve together. Now everyone, it's time to tell you more about our sponsor Beam because again, once again, without these sponsors, it would not be possible to do the work that I do here on YouTube. So again, a huge thank you to Beam and I wanna share with you how this product has absolutely transformed my sleep. Now, most of my YouTube audience is above the age of 40 and as we age, sleep becomes more and more difficult for us. In my job, I'm constantly monitoring global events and I'm often up early in the morning or staying up late at night to see what's really happening in the world. Over the years, I've really struggled to get consistent sleep. But a few months ago, I started taking Beam's signature product, Dream, which is a nighttime blend of powerful ingredients like reishi mushrooms, magnesium, and melatonin, all designed to improve relaxation and improve your sleep quality. So let me tell you about my exact bedtime routine now. About 30 minutes before bedtime, I simply mix in one scoop of Dream Blend into hot water and stir with the bean frother. Not only am I sleeping the best I have in years, but my favorite part about this product is actually the taste. I've been drinking the peanut butter cocoa and cocoa cinnamon blends, and honestly, it's like having a little treat before bed, and the best part, is there's no sugar and only 15 calories. As always, you have my promise as a content creator that I only recommend products that I have personally used and tested, and I've been taking Beam for a few months now, and I can confidently say that I highly recommend this product to you. If you struggle with sleep, and are looking for a healthy natural solution, simply click on the link in my description and use my code CYRUS to get 35% off your first order when you subscribe and then 20% off all following orders. Plus, when you subscribe to the Dream Powder, you will receive a free frother with your first order and you can pause, skip, or cancel at any time. So there is zero risk to you. So once again, thank you to Beam for sponsoring today's important video about Xinjiang and China, and thank you all for your continued support. I look forward to seeing you all in our next video soon.